Everybody can hear me? Okay, thank you so very much. What a beautiful turnout, turn, turnout here. I, I don't think we can ask for a better location. Driving down here is always fun. Community is awesome. People, patients, everybody. You know, I think I really I'm thankful for everyone to, who's, who showed up here. And it's my absolute pleasure and honor. And we're going to talk about some of the science stuff, some of the common stuff. And I see that you guys have most of you guys have already gone through pulmonary rehab. So you guys are actually more expert than me in pulmonary rehab. <laughs> I haven't gone through the program, but yes. But I'm going to talk about the different components of uh, pulmonary rehab program. What is the importance of it? Why we, we preach so much about the pulmonary rehab and uh, in, in cases of chronic respiratory care. So I think this is my disclaimer and disclosure. I'm not an expert, absolutely, in any way in pulmonary rehab, and we'll learn this together. And uh, I do not have any association with any pharmaceutical company. Nobody wants to pay me any money. Yeah, so, so I got no disclosures. All right. So I think uh, Linda has go gone through all of this anyways. The only thing I would tell you is when I was typing it down for the presentation, I realized it's been 22 years since I graduated from med school. In my head, it's only a few years, two or three maybe most. But yes, it's been 22 years since I graduated. Um, and uh, it was an honor to serve as a medical director uh, during the pandemic. I'm not sure if I want to ever do that again. <laughs> so let's hope we never have to do it. But uh, this is uh, all my journey in the, in the field of medicine. I joined Chesapeake Regional Hospital recently maybe seven, eight months ago. So I'm really enjoying and, uh, you know, looking forward to be part of this community as well. Uh, and uh, hopefully serving you guys during this journey. So as she mentioned, this is, uh, this is a leaping into, since we are finishing the cardiac and we're leaping into the pulmonary rehab uh, week. Uh, this is gonna be March uh, 10th to March 16th. And uh, this is second week of March every year we celebrate for pulmonary rehab. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. Now, this is basically the introduction of pulmonary rehab. Um, this is basically showing you what components in a, in a very concise way, and we will dissect it down into different parts. Pulmonary rehab basically improves your symptoms, quality of life, your pulmonary function, your healthcare utilization, and it actually can improve the survival in patients. American Thoracic Society has really, you know, further defined it as a comprehensive, comprehensive intervention based on a thorough patient assessment followed by patient-tailored therapies that include but are not limited to exercise training, education, behavior changes designed to improve physical and psychological condition of patients with chronic respiratory diseases and to promote the long-term adherence of health-enhancing behaviors. So how do we select these patients? Uh, who are the patients that really need pulmonary rehab? Pretty much, I would say, anybody who is symptomatic from a pulmonary standpoint, from their respiratory disease standpoint, can potentially benefit from a pulmonary rehab program, a comprehensive rehab program. Most of uh, our uh, research and uh, education comes from uh, COPD patients. So a lot, of, a lot of time we refer the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients for the pulmonary rehab, but it's not limited to only chronic obstructive pulmonary disease patients. The American Thoracic Society also extend that uh, recommendation to patients with interstitial lung diseases, patients who have pulmonary hypertension, and uh, there are very few contraindications for the pulmonary rehab program. And these are very common sense kind of contraindications. People who have really terrible heart disease and they're not able to participate because of their advanced heart disease should not be participating in the, in the pulmonary rehab program. People who have severe arthritis or other obstacles, either whether they are neurological obstacles or cognitive issues that prevent their participation to pulmonary rehab, you know, you, they, 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 they probably will not be a good candidate for pulmonary rehab program. How do we evaluate patients uh, before they start? And most of my clinical, I mean, I, you can go through the list of these things. 
but most commonly when patients come and see me, what we want to know is what is their baseline exercise capacity, how much they can walk. Simple walk test, what we call six minute walk test. We walk you back and forth between the cones. We monitor your heart rate, monitor your, your uh, oxygen saturation. It's a really good tool to give us some idea what exercise capacity do you have. And the pulmonary function tests are the basic breathing test, we, in, in, in other words, we call them. You breathe in a little machine on the computer, we monitor your breathing capacity. It gives us idea what your physiological uh, uh, abilities are. Do you have COPD or not? Do you have any restrictive lung disease or not? And those are the basic uh, tests that we do before the pulmonary rehab start. And of course, once you go through the pulmonary rehab, we also do further testing and repeat those tests to see if, if there's any improvement. And then we continue those testing as a part of our regular uh, workup during your follow-ups with us as, as an outpatient. Mostly, I would say, uh, for COPD patients, uh, generally once a year kind of thing uh, that we, we get these tests. And uh, pulmonary rehab has actually shown to improve your, your pulmonary uh, six-minute walk test by impressive 351 feet on mean. So that's, that's a quite impressive improvement when we say, uh, when we finish the pulmonary rehab. Uh, what is the best setting for pulmonary rehab? I don't think anybody has really clearly defined that this is the best setting, but pulmonary rehab can be started even in the hospital setting when you are sick or you are recovering from your pulmonary disease. It can be done as an outpatient setting, like you know, pulmonary rehab programs that we have. And uh, this uh, can be done, uh, in some cases, even in the home settings as well. Um, and then we talk, we'll talk briefly about like, you know, some of those digital measures that can be achieved and can, uh, can uh, uh, achieve some results, good results with that. And uh, most of our research uh, papers and research work generally involve the programs that have one, two, three visits per week kind of thing. And mostly our outpatient programs right now are about two to three visits per week. And they are so good in tailoring those programs uh, to cater your need. And as she mentioned, that these are more individualized approaches that we have to uh, provide to the patients because not everybody's the same. Not everybody can come in five days a week. So everybody has to be addressed. Everybody needs, has to be addressed. Some are working, some are not working mobility issues, so those, those things needs to be uh, taken into consideration as well. And mainly monitoring wise, we just monitor these parameters basically looking at your degree of shortness of breath, your breath sounds, how much you're sweating or not, you know, uh, your blood pressure, your heart rate and oxygenation. We don't generally do a complete tele monitoring, you know, that's just the basic uh, parameters that we measure. There is not a lot of difference between the programs, whether is the four week is good enough or seven week is good. But we have seen in different research papers that the longer the program is, and we're talking about about eight to 12 weeks kind of thing, the more durable benefits you will get out of the program uh, from uh, the pulmonary rehab. And then there are programs uh, that are designed, they just call, these are called maintenance programs. These maintenance programs are after you finish your main pulmonary rehab program, these maintenance programs are designed to follow up maybe once a week kind of thing. And these, pro these maintenance programs have shown to improve the exercise capacity, your dyspnea, which is shortness of breath or degree of shortness of breath, your health status, and actually continue to improve your six minute walk distance as well. And uh, of course, it's a digital life these days. There have been digital programs. There has been a little bit more data coming out. People who are using these maintenance program through an app and maybe an activity tracker, you know, uh, there have been some data that has also shown that this continues to show improvement in these patient population as well. Now, this is a laundry list of things because whenever people say pulmonary rehab, it just doesn't mean that you're just gonna go there and, and, and work on a bike or treadmill and that's it. Pulmonary rehab is, is a comprehensive program. It should be a comprehensive program and should include all these different components to, 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 to uh, bring them together to provide a comprehensive care to our pulmonary patients. And then we will, we will further. Now, 
Exercise training, basically, uh, we divide this uh, exercise training into three major categories. This is a major uh, component of pulmonary rehab. There is endurance training, there is internal training, and there is resistance or strength training. Now, endurance training we all are familiar with. This is basically conditioning. This is the most common method. Most of you have gone through. There is involved the upper extremity exercises, lower extremity exercises with the use of ergometers. And usually you do it for about three to five times a week for maybe 20 to 30 uh, minutes at a time. Uh, these do improve the skeletal muscle function. It decreases your respiratory or uh, ventilatory demands for exercise and improves your exercise capacity. So, so these are different examples, the leg ergometer and the, the arm ergometer. Now, a common question sometimes people ask, like, how does exercise improve endurance? It's not entirely clear, but there has been a lot of research and data about their um, molecular improvement after you do the exercises, and those in turn improve their symptoms and improve their exercise capacity. So there has been a lot of uh, data that, that increasing skeletal, uh, that the exercise, it increases the skeletal muscle oxidative enzyme it also improves the lactic acid clearance and ventilation after training. So uh, exercise act on the, on, on the molecular level and improve these, these functions of the cells to help you provide those benefits that uh, we, we see with the pulmonary rehab. Now, busy slide again, sorry about that, but this is about interval training. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with interval trainings. Uh, this is a pretty popular concept these days. Interval training are very high intensity exercises followed by periods of, of either low intensity exercises or rest. And uh, we do this in, in, in intervals that could last for a minute, two minutes. Usually, generally, we try to keep it less than a minute, a high intensity activity, and then low intensity or rest, and then continue with that cycles uh, uh, you know, until you reach your goal. Um, it's pretty uh, popular in those patients uh, who have difficulty doing 30 minutes of a continuous ergometer or you know, either leg or treadmill or any other activity. But this has shown that it has similar improvement in quality of life and your six minute walk distance. Uh, the Bode index is an index that we commonly use to assess for people whose, it, uh, whose BMI, which is the body mass index, which is basically weight and height related, it improves the BMI of patients. It can improve the obstruction, which is basically your lung function, and it can improve your dyspnea, which is a degree of shortness of breath, and it can improve your exercise capacity, which is basically your six minute walk test. Uh, the optimal duration is of interval training, again, we don't know exactly 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, which one is, is, is the best. I think we should tailor it to the patient and ad advise them whatever best they can do should be the, the, uh, the best for the, the patients. And then you can actually enhance it and slowly and progressively improve it and uh, can graduate into maybe transitioning into the endurance training and once their exercise capacities are improved. Uh, resistance training is basically your weight trainings. You, you target specific muscle groups. You do repetitive exercises, build your, your muscles, not necessarily the muscles of respiration. We'll talk about that in, the, in a later slide, but individual muscle group, your arms, your leg muscle group, uh, thighs, quadriceps, bicep, triceps, all of these muscle groups targets, uh, and, uh, target, are targeted. And it has shown that it has additive benefit to the endurance training. It actually improves your endurance training by about 16%. So this is also a part of the, of the pulmonary rehab. Now, there have been alternative uh, exercise modes which basically focus on breath training, ventilator training, and uh, we'll talk about all of these in a little bit, Tai Chi and flexibility training and some of the benefits of those, uh, those different modalities. Um, breath training is, is, is a common concept and I want you guys to understand and people 
maybe who have COPD would be able to better correlate with this rapid shallow breathing. Now, rapid shallow breathing is a term that we commonly use in people who have chronic obstructive pulmonary disease where they're breathing very shallow and they're breathing very rapidly. They can't get the breath out properly and they have to take another breath because they're short, so short of breath. Now, there is, this is the lungs, the, the anatomy of lung goes that it starts from the nose passages, goes all the way into the trachea, and then it has about 20 generations of bronchi, and finally leads to the air pockets, which are the alveoli. Now, the gas exchange happens in the alveoli and not in the airways. So you have uh, about 150 to 200 cc's of air in those airways that are not being that are not participating in any kind of gas exchange. That's called basically dead space. Now, when you are breathing shallow and rapid, what you're doing is you're just moving barely that air in and out. It's not participating into, into the actual ventilation process, which is happening deep down in your, your alveoli. So we, we need to reduce that dead space and we need to improve that, that rapid shallow breathing so there has been techniques to improve those, those rapid shallow breathing that can prevent this air trapping that happens uh, in, in the COPD patients. And I remember one of my mentors always give me the example of Michelin man. Now, this is happening to most of the COPD patients because when you're taking that breath in, you're getting the air in, but because your airways are obstructed, you're not able to exhale properly. And when you're not able to exhale properly, before you exhale it all the way, you have to take another breath. What's gonna happen? You're stacking the breath. And then you take another breath, and you take another breath, and you take another breath. So your lungs are breathing at a very high level. So the balloon is already inflated. That inflation makes it harder for you to breathe further into that. The resistance is so hard to put more breath in. So in order to slow that process down, we use different techniques to help people with the COPD to be able to exhale that. One of the common methods we use is personal breathing or fish mouth breathing. Teaching those methods in the pulmonary rehab is important part, being able to exhale it properly so you can get more air in and get more oxygen through. So these have uh, shown uh, yoga's personal breathing can help improve your oxygen saturation. It can improve your shortness of breath it actually improves your tidal volume, which is the volume of air going in and out of the lungs. Um, diaphragmatic breathing is a little bit more variable, variable results. This is mainly just focusing on the diaphragm and the descent of diaphragm, and some people are able to focus that. There have been some studies that have shown some improvement, but it is very hard to individually train a muscle because all the muscles have to work in synchrony. Now, these are ventilatory muscles. Um, we, in some cases where we are unable to fix your lungs, we can reverse the emphysema. But what we can do is we can train the individual respiratory muscles that participate and, and be uh, uh, part of the respiratory system that can improve the ventilation. And these inspiratory, there are a ton of muscles uh, the sternocleidomastoid uh, muscle, these are accessory muscles, they are intercoastal muscles. Uh, in the carefully selected patients, these can improve your quality of life and training these muscles can improve your walk distance as well. Um, now, this is more for patients who have, uh, who have a very severe disease and they're not able to, to participate in any kind of, of, uh, of a pulmonary rehab or exercise programs. Uh, this is basically neuromuscular electrical stimulations, and these are provided to individual muscles, the thigh muscles, building your arm muscles, and these electrical impulses contract and relax those muscles and help build those skeletal muscles. So these have also uh, been shown to improve the, the limb muscle strength and exercise capacity. Of course, there are some contraindications, people with pacemakers, seizures, uncontrolled cardiac disease, unstable angina, or severe uh, knee or hip osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis should not be doing these things. Tai Chi is a type of martial arts. There has been some data. I don't know if everybody is familiar about Tai Chi or not. These are very slow and rhythmic movements that help 
you focus on your mental health and also focus on the breathing as well. And there has been some data that shows that the Tai Chi's benefit are, are pretty impressive for people who, who, uh, who either undergo pulmonary rehab or who have chronic respiratory diseases. And it actually in one study, their, their benefits actually go and extend beyond the regular traditional pulmonary rehab as well. So this is a neat concept as well that uh, can benefit people uh, with uh, pulmonary rehab. These are flexibility training. These are not very well studied. Posture training, thoracic mobility. Uh, so it's probably not like really uh, 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 you know, a big part of the pulmonary rehab at this point, but maybe down the road. Now, education is a key. I think these days I tell my, my patients that you have access to a ton of information these days. Uh, you don't have to look for a book. You don't have to look for, you know, to go to a library. You have everything in your pockets. You can research your diseases. You can find information. And we try to make this pulmonary rehab uh, as an important um, a platform where we can provide you further education uh, about your respiratory diseases so you can manage it more properly. I tell people that we have, what, 20, 30 minutes in a visit. We can't educate you all about your disease in that short period of time. You have to invest yourself. And these programs are, are very helpful and very beneficial to my patients. When they go and they spend more time with these folks, they educate them properly and they help them manage their diseases adequately. So this is an important part of, uh, of the pulmonary rehab. I want to, of course, not for, forget about smoking. Now, this is, this is actually, of course, in a pulmonologist's office, the most common problem we see is, uh, is it people with ongoing smoking, people who have been a smoker. Of course, they have done the best thing they can do. But people who are actively smoking, they have very difficult time completing their pulmonary rehab programs. And it is one of the most important predictor that will predict whether you are going to be able to finish the pulmonary rehab or not. If you are an active smoker, we should do our level best. We should try our level best to, to, to get you to quit smoking. I tell my patients very commonly, this is a battle. You have to win that battle. You have to use every single resource that's available out there. It is an addiction. It is one of the toughest addiction to break uh, because of its physiological and psychological components. And there is help available. You know, there are support groups. There are, there are nicotine replacement uh, uh, products available. There are designer drugs that can help you quit smoking. Um, so uh, being participating in a pulmonary rehab program actually can help you quit smoking as well because they provide you with the education, support, what is needed to, to help quit smoking. Of course, oxygen in our chronic respiratory patients, uh, we need to know when is oxygen needed, who needs oxygen, is it needed in the rest, is it needed in the activity, is it needed when you're sleeping, what type of oxygen devices are available, these education and these should be a part of the pulmonary rehab program. And uh, we usually try our level best to provide you this education when you come and see us as well. But of course, when you are part of the group, you're meeting other people, this also helps, of course, not smoke when, you're, <laughs> when you have oxygen use. And you wouldn't be surprised, I've seen some, some serious stuff happening. <laughs> Do not attempt that, <laughs> okay. All right, so we have nutrition as the next uh, aspect, very important aspect. So there are two ends of the spectrum, nutrition, there's no one good diet, I would say, oh, this is good for your lungs and this is not good for your lungs. This is not rocket science. Eating healthy, eating appropriate calories, managing your weight. You don't want to be on one end or the other end of the spectrum. You don't want to be overweight, you don't want to be underweight as well. See, in chronic respiratory cases, in the initial phases, we see that people who have chronic respiratory diseases end up gaining weight because they're not able to participate in a lot of physical activities. They are not able to, to participate in social, socialization. So they end up spending a lot of sedentary time 
which ends up translating into you're not burning your calories, you're ending up storing them as the fat muscles and tissues. So eating healthy is important. On the other spectrum, when you are, your chronic lung disease is far advanced, you are using a lot more energy that your body can handle. Your respiratory rate is so high, you can't, your, your, your nutrition cannot keep up, you end up developing a catabolic state, which, and you, which means that you end up losing more and more weight in the, and you lose more and more skeletal muscles. So your support for your lungs is being lost because of that high demand of breathing. You're spending all your energy breathing and you end up losing so much muscle mass that eventually you become more cachectic and that can be deleterious for your breathing. I think the, most of the programs will teach you how to use your medication. There is a wide variety of inhalers. You, you, you open your eyes, there's a new inhaler on the market. Uh, we have to be aware which inhalers are right for which patients. Are you able to use it properly? Is it, it, is, it, is it delivering the medicine where it needs to be delivered or not? I've seen people using the inhalers like perfumes. <laughs> not good, you know. I'm not even kidding. Uh, I have somebody who told me that you're using inhaler this way. So, so that's not going to go get any benefit from you, for you. So these are important part of the component of the pulmonary rehab. Of course, health preservation, your self-management of disease, avoidance of irritants, avoidance of smoking. One of the biggest things that people with chronic respiratory diseases can do a favor to their lung is get vaccinations. Now, vaccination is extremely important part of management of respiratory diseases. Every time you have a flare-up of COPD or a pneumonia, you lose a part of your lung function that you will never get back. This is something you have to keep in mind. Get all the vaccinations that are recommended for your age and your, your, uh, your, uh, uh, your disease, including pneumonia vaccine, influenza, COVID vaccine, and nowadays even RSV vaccines as well. So make sure you are vaccinated. Now these all measures are helpful, but as I mentioned, these are not substitute for your exercise training. So, so keep in mind that. We all need to make sure that people with the respiratory diseases should be aware of the natural progression of their disease as well. You need to be prepared. You need to, to make some decisions. You need to make sure there are understanding for your prognosis. You need to make sure that to what extent you want your physicians to go when you are in advanced in diseases. So you need to make sure you have your surrogate decision maker, advanced directives, end of life care. These are all important part of the program and people with the advanced diseases should be aware of these, uh, these issues that can arise. Now, psychological health is, uh, is another, I think we ignore it quite a bit in patients with chronic respiratory diseases. People with chronic respiratory diseases, they oftentimes have difficulty or decreased participation in their physical, social, or sexual behaviors. And, and the most important thing that pulmonary rehab can provide you is to improve that. That's, that's, a, that's an amazing outcome that people can achieve while just participating in the pulmonary rehab program. And it actually first, you know, uh, it's more effective than your, your psychotherapy sessions. So participating in a pulmonary rehab program, I'm not saying ditch your uh, psychotherapy sessions, but participation in, in the pulmonary rehab can be more beneficial than, uh, than your psychotherapy sessions if you have underlying depression. Now, these are all list of things that pulmonary rehab can improve, your decreased the dyspnea scores, quality of life, fewer hospitalization, your decreased utilization of healthcare. It has improvement in the mortality and it improves your exercise lung capacity. It improves your frailty index, which is improving your robustness. I know that we talked about a lot about the COPD, but I don't want to ignore these diseases. There have been strong evidence. It helps improve quality of life in interstitial lung diseases bronchitis, cystic fibrosis, asthma, pulmonary hypertension, lung cancer, lung transplantation, and last 
but not the least is the long COVID. A lot of people are, these days are suffering from long COVID symptoms. They have shortness of breath, they have trouble breathing. People don't know what to do. There has been evidence actually now with multiple studies showing that long COVID symptoms are improved with the pulmonary rehab. Muscle strength, walk capacity, quality of life, lung function, your six minute walk test, it helps. So, so these are numerous, numerous benefit that spans around all fields that help people with chronic respiratory diseases. And that's why we advocate about the pulmonary rehabilitation program for patients who are suffering from chronic respiratory diseases. And I think these guys are doing a wonderful job in this community. And I'm looking forward to be part of this community down the road as well. And definitely looking forward to send our patients to them to be participating in that. But with that, I want to thank you everyone for, for listening to me. And uh, hopefully you get 20% out of this. And <laughs> hopefully this will benefit you down the road as well. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.